If it's Thursday, Democratic divisions on display as the party grapples with the politics of rising crime. With President Biden telling Democrats he's not going to veto a D.C. crime bill that's been backed mostly by Republicans. Days after Chicago's Democratic mayor was ousted by voters with crime as the key issue. Plus, Secretary of State Antony Blinken meets his Russian counterpart face to face for the first time since Russia invaded Ukraine. It wasn't a long meeting, but at least it happened, as rising U.S.-China tensions dominate the world stage at this week's G20 summit. And Iranian officials open an investigation after hundreds of Iranian schoolgirls have been hospitalized, apparently after being poisoned in a potential mass attack across the nation's cities. Happy Thursday. Welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Chuck Todd reporting in Washington. Folks, nothing has split the current Democratic Party or drawn as clear of a contrast between the progressive wing and the moderate wing, quite like the issue of crime and policing. And right now, from local city elections all the way up to the White House, Democratic Party leaders are clearly struggling to navigate this issue, the politics of it, and how it's divided voters. This afternoon, President Biden told Senate Democrats in a closed-door meeting on Capitol Hill today that he was going to side with the Republicans and some moderates on a piece of legislation that would block a series of progressive crime policies in the city of Washington, D.C. Some Democrats wanted him to veto the bill. He told them he's not going to do it. This move not only goes against the more progressive wing of the party on the, on the issue of policing, but it also goes against Biden's avowed support of D.C. home rule. Even though the mayor of D.C., Muriel Bowser, herself tried to veto these rules that her progressive city council passed. So, yeah, this issue is a bit complicated. Still, Biden's move means this will be the first time in three decades that Congress has essentially nullified a law passed in the District of Columbia. But on the larger point of crime and policing, Biden's decision arguably shows how spooked Democrats are that crime will be used as a political cudgel against them in 2024. So this is a decision Biden's making, not as president of the United States, but as leader of the Democratic Party. Because guess what? The party got quite a reminder of the political peril of the issue this week in Chicago, where elevated crime rates played a significant role in Mayor Lori Lightfoot's loss in the city's mayoral primary Tuesday, making her the first mayor in 40 years to lose re-election after just one term and the first incumbent mayor in the city's history not to even make it to the runoff. The two candidates who advanced to the mayoral runoff, both Democrats, are very far apart ideologically on the issue of public safety, illustrating the two paths forward for the party. You have former Chicago Schools CEO Paul Vallis. He has made being tough on crime a central issue, while Cook County Commissioner Brandon Johnson promised to focus on more progressive policing policies. Is the fundamental right of every American. It is a civil right. We will have a safe Chicago. We will make Chicago the safest city in America. We can defeat this structural inequality. We have built a multiracial, multi generational movement from one end of the city to the other end of the city. We can build a better, stronger, safer Chicago. And tonight is just the beginning. I've got a whole slew of our reporters on this story. I've got Ali Rafa uh, with the latest from the White House and President Biden's decision. Ali Vitale is on Capitol Hill to talk a little bit about the pressure some congressional Democrats are actually putting on President Biden to give them cover. And right here at the desk is Natasha Karecki, who is usually based in Chicago for us. She's been covering that mayor's race, but luckily for us, she is here in D.C. Ali, let me start with you because right now, I believe Karine Jean Pierre is really struggling to explain this decision of the president who is for D.C. statehood, for D.C. home rule, but clearly is nervous about the politics of this, this uh, crime bill that the D.C. city council passed over the objections of their own mayor. 
Yeah, Chuck, up until this point, the White House had just said that they were not in favor of the House voting to gut this crime bill, but they hadn't really talked about the possibility of Biden, of President Biden vetoing it. Now he's coming out and sort of explaining why uh, the reason behind his reasoning. He, tech, uh, he tweeted just a short time ago, quote, I support D.C. statehood and home rule, but I don't support some of the changes D.C. Council put forward over the mayor's objections, such as lowering penalties for carjackings. If the Senate votes to overturn what D.C. Council did, I will sign it. This is sort of a, a political test for him. It, it shows not only, as you mentioned, that he uh, is in favor of keeping that home rule, that unique position by Congress to sort of meddle in the affairs of the D.C. City, city Council and D.C. voters, but it also shows ahead of 2024 where President Biden could yeah. be going with this. You can imagine, uh, had he chose to veto this uh, crime bill that's expected right. to pass in the Senate when it does come up next sometime next week, you can imagine how much uh, Republicans would have seized on that and used that right. in 2024 for possible campaign ads. Uh, so this is really serving as a, a litmus test and an example of how Democrats are going to take up this opportunity to talk about crime leading into 2024. Republicans have uh, attacked Democrats saying that they are for mm -hmm. defunding the police. That's something uh, that President Biden has said the opposite of for years now. He said that, uh, as, as a matter of fact, uh, police reform will include, in his opinion, more officers on the streets. Right. But this is definitely a test for 2024 and how President Biden, if and when he decides to run, which yeah. is looking very possible right now, very likely, how he'll handle this issue of crime coming up, Chuck. Ali, I'm curious, was he asked now if he was going to have a preference in the runoff in Chicago? And the reason I ask this, I could argue... He already has endorsed in this Chicago runoff. He just doesn't realize it yet because if he is against the new policies that the D.C. City Council did, then he obviously would like to see Paul Vallis win that runoff. How are they handling the Chicago question in that press room right now? So up until yesterday, the White House had said that the president would be willing to work with anyone, anyone who eventually uh, wins this mayoral race that's going off into a runoff on April 4th. Uh, that hasn't been brought up in the briefing as of right now that I've seen. Uh, but that is something that Karine Jean-Pierre will have to address, mm -hmm. that President Biden will eventually have to come to terms with whoever wins this race and uh, come up with a plan on how they're going to address this crime issue. As you mentioned, this is an issue that's facing not just Chicago, Chicago, but so many major American yep. cities that have seen a spike in crime since the COVID-19 pandemic began. So that's definitely an issue at the top of mind, at the top right. of mind for this administration, Chuck. All right, Ali Raff at the White House for us. Ali, thank you. Ali Vitale, um, I had a birdie tell me that what Biden did today was providing cover for a whole bunch of Senate Democrats uh, who want to get, who wanted to vote to nullify this law, but didn't want to didn't want to get in the president's way, if you will. They were looking for some cover, and the president provided them the cover. And it looks like now you have a rush of Democrats announcing they're going to vote for this bill. Yeah, because the realities of the Senate map become real, real fast around here, especially in this Senate climate where Democrats know they are defending such a slim majority and they're doing it with a map that's pretty unfavorable to them. I mean, the fact that someone like John Tester is going to again try to keep his seat in Montana is something that has Gary Peters, the head of the Democratic Senate campaign arm, breathing a little bit easier, but that's still a red state. Of course, questions about how Joe Manchin will ultimately go up in 2024. He yep. said yesterday he's going to be involved. I don't, I mean, right. you can speak Manchinese however you want on that, but how he's involved is going to be important because that's going to be a tough seat for Democrats to keep. And then you even look over to Pennsylvania. Bob Casey now, in the aftermath of Biden coming here to Capitol Hill and saying that he wouldn't veto this, Bob Casey is now saying, yeah, when this comes up, I'm probably going to vote, a, vote, vote right. for it. So this is the reality of the Senate map in 2024 coming into play on D.C. home politics, but it's got much bigger implications. Uh, what else was mentioned, brought up at this meeting? Clearly, this was something that, that some in the, in the party wanted him to get out of the way. I mean, trust me, uh, you and I both know Joe Biden considers himself the third senator of Pennsylvania at times. So he knew, <laughs> he knew what Bob Casey was thinking before he made this decision. 
Yeah, correct. And, you know, man of the Senate forever, right? He spent some time in the mm -hmm. Senate Foreign Relations Room after he left the Senate lunch. This is still a place that he clearly feels so comfortable. Right. But look, as he was huddling with his Democratic colleagues here, what one of them told me was that this was just a friendly lunch. Aside right. from the news around those D.C. laws, this was really just a, a gathering for them to talk about what the path forward was going to look like. Biden did this with House Democrats last night. The key is just implementation. Focus on what we've done for the last two years. Try to show right. tangible gains out of the majority and give people proof of purchase with Democrats right. as they go into an election year that's tough on the Senate side, tough on the House side. And if Biden gets in, when he gets in, if he gets in, you know, we can go around in circles. Today he said, I'll announce when I announce. But clearly as he's toying with this, he's trying to lay the groundwork in a congressional sense for right. everyone to be marching in lockstep on, we did a lot of things the last two years. Right. Let's tell the American people about it. Hey, very quickly, we, we're down two Democratic senators right now not doing business which means we're at a technically 49-49. Uh, yeah. Tiebreakers are needed. I mean, is this going to slow down business? Both Diane Feinstein, John Fetterman's hospitalized, yep. and apparently Diane Feinstein is, is still in California, whether yeah. uh, for a health issue, not clear if she's been hospitalized. Yeah, dealing with a medical issue is what her team says. But yes, we're already starting to see, look, the main focus of this Senate is judicial nominees, judicial nominees, judicial nominees. We're already starting to see a little bit of a shifting calendar around that. There could be a few reasons for it, but it's definitely something to keep an eye on, especially as Fetterman's team has said, this is going to be a weeks long process for him as he deals with mental health issues right now. And that's something that they are obviously focused on entirely. So Feinstein being home in California, Fetterman being in the hospital here or getting the treatment that he needs rather not in the hospital um, all of that factors in when you again have these slim slim majorities it was the story of last Congress and it continues to this one Ali Vitale and Capitol Hill for us Ali thank you all right let me bring in Natasha Karecki who's normally based in Chicago for us uh, this is not a local race and I think that that is, is today's news in some ways shows you how much this race could get nationalized depending on who wins and I say this meaning the race itself, it looks like it's going to be a pretty big ideological divide. But you fill in the blanks. You tell me. Absolutely. I, you know, Paul Vallis, uh, the fact that you have a law and order pseudo Republican who is. What makes right him, I, I hear this a lot. Uh, what evidence that he's a pseudo Republican? Well, he once said, I tend to be more of a Republican. So mm -hmm. that's one thing. Um, and just listen to his messaging right now. Mm -hmm. um, he is he's very law and order. And the fact that he is that is his message. He wants more cops on the street. Right. He wants to bring some back and he wants to add more. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that that is his message should have every Democrat standing at attention right now. Who's Eric he, Adams message? In New York. Absolutely. Too. Right. I mean, right. there is right there. there this I, I think there's a whole bunch of law and order Democrats showing up these days again. Right. Right, yeah. and it's because of public safety. I mean, what Chicagoans are saying is we need somebody to get this under control right now. Not invest in the future. Yes, we want you to invest in our communities, but please get this under control right now. If you don't have public safety, if people do not feel safe, you cannot do anything else. And that's what Chicagoans are screaming for. Mm -hmm. I, I went to a Lori Lightfoot event, and I was, you know, this is people who are, you know, tending to, to favor her. Mm -hmm. And she talked a very good talk about crime, investments, the judicial system. Afterward, I talked to people and they said, I still don't feel safe. I don't I don't think she gets it. it, it it's it's and, and what what Dallas is saying is I'm going to fix this right now. I'm going to go in and fix What's his this. plan? Does his he have plan, one? Well, there's oh, he wants to add. He wants to bring back 1800 mm -hmm. uh, police officers that they're down right now. And he wants to add another hundreds um, beyond not, that. A lot of people are trying to add police officers. Finding police officers is actually quite difficult. It right is now. very difficult, especially, especially like ones who are qualified. Uh, particularly in, when you are going to a city like Chicago, who right. wants to go in, in Chicago right now? I mean, it's 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 one it's of the tough toughest job. city cities in the country. Um, it is you know some of the toughest neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. So going there and there's recruitment. I was just at this DeSantis event in Chicago. He's talking about how he's hardcore recruiting Chicago police officers. Come down to Florida. Mm -hmm. You know we'll take care of you. We'll support you. We've got your backs. Right. That's another thing that Dallas is saying. I've got your back. Right. And I think that's what a lot of the, the rank and file wanted to hear right now, why they're backing him. Let's talk about the Lightfoot vote, because it's pretty clear South Side in general, but the Lightfoot voters are probably the easiest way to discern this. Um, you know, she she hit Brandon Johnson for defund the police, at least her campaign did. She never did it herself, though, did she? 
like the campaign would do it, but she never said, hey, why did you do this? She didn't go after him yeah. that hard. And, and, it was and, an odd decision. She clearly was trying to use it against him, but she didn't seem to want to admit it was her doing it. Right. Well, I think it's also part of it is, uh, you know, it's this balance. Think about what swept in Lori Lightfoot, mm -hmm. Laquan McDonald. Right. And she was on the oversight committee at the time. People wanted change then because there is this deep-seated uh, distrust of police officers, it, with law enforcement in the community in Chicago that goes back to the 80s. Especially on the south side. Yeah. Especially on the south side. You had, you know, well-documented torturing of murder s suspects right. who were wrongly accused, freed from death row. Um, that goes back decades and decades. So y she's dealing with that on top of the Laquan McDonald. That's when she swept in. So it is this balance. I mean, Dallas is going to go in now, and that's why I do think some of this is a hot take. Mm -hmm. I mean, Chicago is very complex, right. and they, they have a very, these people have a very complicated um, relationship with the police. And, and, and if you go too hard, you, they want it under control, right. but they don't want you to go too hard. I was just going to say, they want more cops on the streets. They just want good cops on the streets. Exactly. I mean, when you talk to folks on the south side, right? Like, that's what you hear, and, and I think that's going to be, how does Brandon Johnson navigate that? Right. And that's going to be, I mean, th that is going to be really difficult for him. They're throwing this defund the police at him, mm -hmm. and he has actually already walked away from that. Lori Lightfoot endorsed here or not? Or do you think she stays neutral? I think she endorses. I think she gets involved. You do? Which side? Her hatred seems to be yeah, I was just gonna <laughs> directed say, was she more angry now? Yeah. She, more angry. she seems to be more angry with Vallis than, well, than, than, than Johnson, but there's the Chicago Teachers Union. I was just going to say, which, of it. which so teachers it is, union is she more, is a, which union is she more angry with? It is with, a right? tough one. Yeah. It is a tough one. Natasha, correct you, a great story to follow. Thanks, Jack. And we'll be following it with you. Uh, and before that, thank you to Ali Rafa and Ali Vitali. Uh, coming up, red meat and no shows. The highlights and lowlights from the opening day of the conservative confab known as CPAC. We are live in National Harbor, Maryland next. Welcome back. While some of the divisions inside the Democratic Party on crime are on display here in Washington and in Chicago, the divisions inside the GOP are out in full view just a little ways down from here down the Potomac River at CPAC. What was once the event that united the conservative movement inside the Republican Party has become a red meat rally for the party's most pro-Trump forces. Some Republicans appear to be a bit wary of associating themselves with this gathering this year. Top members in Congress are not attending. Neither is their party chair. Same goes for a couple of top presidential candidates, perhaps the second most important candidate in the field these days, Ron DeSantis, plus the last vice president, Mike Pence. Both of them don't want to be at CPAC. Few of them will actually be at a competing group's event this weekend, an event which notably does not include Donald Trump. And while former President Trump will address CPAC this weekend, another cloud hangs over this event, thanks to organizer Matt Schlapp being under investigation for sexual misconduct connected to the Herschel Walker campaign. Dasha Burns joins me now live from CPAC. And day one CPAC, a little subdued. Uh, I think the bigger names that show up are tomorrow, then we have President Trump on Friday, former President Trump. What are you hearing? What's the theme? And it, what does turnout look like? Well, you're right, Chuck. The buzz around CPAC this year is less about what's happening on the stage behind me and more about who is not taking the stage. And the other big part of the story is sort of the shift in tone and in uh, substance here at CPAC since the Trump era. So right now on stage behind me is a panel called Parents with Pitchforks. Earlier today, there was another panel called, quote, Sacking the Woke Mob. You know, this, as you mentioned, used to be sort of the center of gravity for uh, conservatives with really a focus on conservative policy. You know, this is the setting where Reagan gave his city on a hill speech. It's where speaker, speaker spots were coveted by political up and comers and where there was really a focus on those uh, conservative staple issues of immigration, national security, fiscal responsibility uh, that has shifted here. And as you said, this really is the Trump show. And you've got that split screen with what's happening here and then what's happening down in Florida uh, with DeSantis and uh, former Vice President Mike Pence at that Club for Growth uh, event. 
Here's the thing, though, Chuck, despite the Trump centric focus here at CPAC, I do keep hearing the name Ron DeSantis come up as I'm talking to uh, folks who are attending here. A lot of people disappointed that he's not here, some even uh, hoping that he might show up at some point. And, and you know, there <laughs> is going to be a straw poll at the end. Uh, he's, he's very likely not showing up, by the way. We haven't heard anything of the likes. Um, but it, it, it's notable, you know, that an event that has really been made in the image of Trump in the last few years. Right. Uh, people are still talking about uh, that potential rival in 2024. And there's going to be a straw poll at the end of this event. And while DeSantis is not here, mm. uh, he is going to be on the ballot. Trump is likely going to t run away with it, right? But if DeSantis can even run up the numbers a little bit, that could yeah. be telling in, uh, you know, in this particular crowd. So I... Anybody today get any buzz? I saw J.D. Vance spoke today, Jim Jordan. And it, was there anybody that got, had a following that people were curious about? Or is it just sort of day one and not a lot of people there? There, there is a lot of enthusiasm here, and I've seen uh, groups huddling around the likes of Steve Bannon, Lauren Boebert, Kimberly Guilfoyle was in the hallways. Um, Senators Ted Cruz and J.D. Vance did get a pretty warm, enthusiastic uh, reception for from the audience here. So uh, f folks excited to be here. There is enthusiasm, but they are, are missing some of those uh, higher profile names. Notably, no one's quite talked about wanting to see uh, Senate Minority M Leader Mitch McConnell or Right. Kevin McCarthy already the sort of establishment Republican leadership, the one name that people have been have been bringing up a lot, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. And yeah. he, by the way, we just learned is going to be in Iowa uh, next week. So while he hasn't officially announced right. a run, certainly the behind the scenes machinery is moving. Look, it is an astonishing um, uh, decision by DeSantis to skip CPAC on the week he's launching a book. It tells you how uncomfortable he is to be associated with CPAC this year. Whether it's Trump, whether it's Slap, we don't know. But the fact is he's got a book to sell and he's not going there. That says a lot. Dasha Burns reporting on the ground from National Harbor. Dasha, thank you. Up next, the Republican Party's war on woke is heating up. We'll try to get a definition of it for you. It potentially sets the stage for the first veto of Joe Biden's presidency. I'll explain what it means and why it matters. Panel's next. Welcome back. As we mentioned, President Biden is expected to break out his veto pen for the first time. Both the House and the Senate voted to overturn a Labor Department rule on so-called ESG investments. The rule permits retirement fund managers to consider environmental, social, and corporate governance factors in their investment decisions. Democratic Senators Joe Tester and Joe Manchin, both up for re-election this November, by the way, in some reddish states, joined all Republicans in getting this through the Senate. Republicans say that ESG investing is part of a trend of what they are calling, quote, woke capitalism. And it appears the party is hoping that ESG becomes a new front in the culture war. So joining me now on set is Reuters White House correspondent Jeff Mason, Democratic strategist Heather McGee. She's also the author of The Sum of Us and is out with a new young reader's version of the book. I'd love to see different versions like that. Well done. And then we have National Review Senior Political Correspondent Jim Garrity. Welcome all. Heather, congrats on the book. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, all right. I kind of, in some ways, both of these stories are kind of connected with our culture, but I want to start with the crime issue first. Jeff, this is your beat. This is the White House. Was this a presidential statement or a statement by the leader of the Democratic Party? This decision on, and I want to go to the Washington, D.C., non-veto decision before we get to ESG. Yeah, no, I think that's, a, I think it's a good question. I mean, in, in general, crime is something that we've seen uh, was an issue in the, in the last campaign. Um, it didn't end up We're being, not sure how much it bit yet. But that's just it. It didn't yes. end up being as big of an issue as some, certainly Republicans were saying, ahead of those results. I think another interesting thing to, to talk about that I think Democrats are wanting to keep in mind when the discussion of crime rates is coming up is that voters do care about guns. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I think we'll probably hear more and more from the Democratic side uh, when the Republican attacks come up. That's hey. exactly right. There's mm -hmm. a set of corporations that are making a lot of money flooding our streets with things that kill our families and terrorize us. And what, 20, almost 20 million guns sold last year? That's a big issue. That's a big money and politics issue. It's a corporate power issue. All right, but let me ask a version of this question on this crime bill and here. Did you think that with a Democratic Senate and a Democrat in the White House, that D.C. would have a law nullified? 
No, I really didn't. I mean, it's, it's, it's the, shocking. Yeah. It's shocking. Yeah. If we did not have a president who is shaped by the 80s and the 90s and the issue of crime mm -hmm. in the 1990s, the crack epidemic, uh, the assault weapons ban, all of those fights from that were really central to Joe Biden, who mm -hmm. he is. So I suspect he still, still sees the issue that way. And a president who I don't was know how his... you can't if that's your yeah. experience. I always yeah. say, if you want to understand why a politician does the things yeah. they do, find out how what what yeah. when they first got elected or a, what they were doing. A president yeah. in their 40s might not yeah. see the issue the same way. I was just going to say, do you, you concur with that, that this in some ways Biden's this is a generational view of, of the crime issue? Absolutely. I think he's come a long way in order to be the head of the Democratic Party today, mm -hmm. in order to, in some ways, atone for the excesses of the crime bill mm -hmm. and of that period of time. Um, you know, the American people, when you ask them what keeps you safe, what makes for a safe neighborhood, the first thing they say is great jobs, mm -hmm. good housing, right? Everybody knows that the safest neighborhoods in America are not the ones with the most police on the street, the most jails and prisons, mm -hmm. the harshest sentences. Mm -hmm. They're the ones that have the most economic opportunity. Um, and so that's where he's trying to, I think, both respond to the economic mm -hmm. insecurity that has been a big driver of, mm -hmm. of you know, particularly property crimes, mm -hmm. and deal with guns. He's very strong on guns, but this is, this is one of his flanks. You know, it's interesting, Jeff, to see the White House be sensitive on this crime issue mm -hmm. and sensitive about this sort of, the, some of these, call it a culture war, however you want to, some of these social policy issues that, that the middle of the electorate gets... ESG, he's not worked up on it. He has no fear on this one at all, even as Tester and Manchin. Why? You know what? I think part of the reason why, I haven't spoken to yeah. anyone no. there about it, but my guess is it's also capitalism for investment banks to provide services and products that their clients want. Mm -hmm. And if there are clients that are wanting this and it's in line with their values, which happens to be in line with democratic values, and there are plenty of democratic investors out there, just as there are Republican investors, I don't think that's something that he sees as a clash. Jim, what's the line here? And I'm curious where you are at National Review between government getting involved, mm. like there's a fine line here. DeSantis wants to bar this, right? Some people want to bar yeah. it from happening. That doesn't feel very free market either. Oh, it's not. And Larry Hogan said, oh, I'm a, or, no, it's not, it was Chris Sununu who said yeah. that, well, I'm a limit, fan of limited government. This sounds like big government to me when he was talking about DeSantis intervening with Disney and such. Right. Um, I think what, one of the things this illustrates is that you have your, the 52-48 divide in the Senate. But if you have somebody who's up for re-election mm -hmm. and their state isn't that blue if you're a Democrat, or it's not that red if you're a Republican, mm -hmm. then all of a sudden those last few votes get very wobbly at that moment. Yeah. If, if it's not a re-election year, I don't know if John Tester, you know, makes this kind of decision. Uh, you know, if if, um, if West Virginia wasn't drifting to the right, I don't mm -hmm. know if you'd be seeing the same thing uh, from, you know, from other senators. It, it's kind of one of those things where it comes down to, who, you know, who's up for re-election this year and how much pressure are they feeling? And on this one, I think these two Democratic senators say, you know what, anything too associated with woke yeah. is just not going to play well at home. You know, you hear a lot of, of sort of what I would call sort of middle-of-the-road punditry that says, hey, Republicans are trying to take ESG and turn it into this year's CRT. <laughs> and I don't know if even CRT broke through, per se. No, it didn't, yeah. And I, you know, I can't tell you how many times I have to explain, all right, what, what's this ESG stuff <laughs> right, or the woke right, thing? Yeah. I, it hasn't broken through. It hasn't broken through. Has it? it hasn't broken through. I was just looking at a recent poll, obviously, because my book, The Some of Us, mm -hmm. is out for young readers. So I'm on a tour right now of schools and libraries talking to the, these young people, middle schoolers, mm -hmm. about racism, right? So obviously, the attack on books about race, relevant to me. Mm -hmm. I was looking at the polling and thinking, okay, well, how much traction does this really have? 88% of the public does not want books about racism and even CRT, as nebulously as that defi right. is defined, to be banned. They think that book banning is un-American. Similarly, on ESG, what we're really talking about is not a, a mandate, but saying, yes, of course, it's reasonable for analysts to look at the cost of things like climate externalities. We mm -hmm. had nearly $200 billion in economic loss to climate change in 2022. It matters, of course it matters. How can you take something that causes so much economic upheaval and say that's, that, that analysts would be barred from looking at how that's going to impact investments? Mm -hmm. These are just, in some ways, I think Sheldon Whitehouse did a great job where he said this woke screen is a smoke screen. How did this get, Jim, how did this, how did the ESG become this thing? And I say this mm -hmm. because some of the radicals that yeah. have been for this are people like Glenn Youngkin. <laughs> I mean, you know what I mean? Yeah. The Carlisle Group. Like, this was something that was not really political until it became political. Yeah. 
Um, in your first segment, you talked about how President Biden believes in D.C. statehood. He believes in the D.C. Council. He really wants the district to make its own <laughs> decisions, except not this one. Whoa, not, not that one. You know, that's here. Corporate, you know, most Republicans say, I believe in the free market. I believe that corporations should be able to chart their own course, make their, oh, wait, no, not that one. No, no, no. That, 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 like, you're supposed to be free to make your own decisions, but not that. That's, that's mm -hmm. going in the wrong direction. I, I think everybody's belief in uh, freedom is, gets, gets kind of tenuous. It gets kind of mm -hmm. conditional once things do it. Do you think it's as effective? <sighs> Look, everything, the, everything in the culture war is catnip right now. Mm -hmm. um, for whatever reason, you know, some people get concerned about Russia and Ukraine. Some people get, you know, people yeah. aren't really complaining about tax rates as much as they used to. Culture war is where the energy is, where the engagement is. Listen to yeah. talk radio. So No, I get it. It Jeff, it is one of those things. I get it, but I don't get it. Like yeah. I under I know that it works. I hear that that it fires people up, but I'm like that it's hard to find the there there. Yeah, that's where I struggle. And but I think to pick up on what you were saying is the, the trend here is this attack that Republicans certainly are seeing as effective for them mm -hmm. on wokeness and on the culture war stuff. And that is going from everything to transgender rights yeah. to investing. I don't know that it's going to help them in right. an election, but it's it seems to be helping them with their right. base. Let me pivot to CPAC. Uh, We've gone through these iterations, Jim, with CPAC, where CPAC feels like it's relevant mm -hmm. and CPAC feels like it's not relevant. They feel like we're in one of those points where, because it's so associated with one candidate, it's less relevant. Yeah. Look, if you think of the Venn diagram of the Trump brand and the current CPAC brand, it's a circle. There is no, there's, you know, it's the same right <laughs> it's now, no right? Venn. <laughs> so if you're Ron DeSantis, what good does it do you? Like, I know you said he wants to sell books, but that book's going to sell well. well I agree, but it is sort of weird. This is the biggest event yeah. you could have in yeah. the week or yeah. so. There's a reason he doesn't want to be yeah. there. We'll see what kind of, books. you know, greeting Nikki Haley gets. Yeah. Uh, we'll see what kind of greeting anybody else who's running. But really, mm -hmm. it's a Trump rally. It's a four-day Trump yeah. rally on the Potomac. So if you're Youngkin or somebody else who might be thinking about running against him, what, why would you go there? Mike it, Pence isn't going either, is yeah. he? Yeah, no, he's so, not. I mean, that's well, he's another probably example. not going because he doesn't want to be booed. It, well, indeed. But, I mean, talk, talk, about the worse. <laughs> talk about a shift, though, right? I'm I mean, trying to be polite, guys. Yeah. Jeez, I was yeah. just... Yeah, I see where you guys are going there with Ben. Jeez, I... But also a shift, right? Yeah. I mean, yes, uh, there would be concern about yeah. being booed, but this is a, a man who served President Trump's uh, administration, Heather, obviously. What would you make of the Greg Craig column in the New York Times a couple days ago about, about the running mate business? He was basically saying, well, should, you know, Biden's... That either we have a open nominating yeah, fight yeah, for the yeah. VP... Or there should be, you know, we, we can't ignore the age question in the room. Let's say you on this, and what'd you make of it? So listen, I think in general, the Democratic Party both is worried about the electability of the current president. I think that they, you know, there's general fond feelings towards the ticket, mm -hmm. but people are so scared of Trump and now DeSantis, mm -hmm. really see that authoritarianism is... a possibility if we don't have the most possible popular possible person on the top of the ticket it makes people uncomfortable about these their own alternatives so i mean it is sort of that's one of these the weird thing. things like that's I, I, thing. I hear this worrying and yeah. hand wringing and greg craig wrote an op-ed that in some ways it's a conversation that's being had in washington all right. the time he just put a name to it yeah but this ticket won once yeah it, it really won. Like, it really won. It is amazing, and the lack of confidence Its agenda in it. is enormously popular, and there yeah. have been four, like, once-in-a-generation landmark pieces of legislation that has come out. I think it has to do with, you know, the Beltway conversation. You don't I think, think it's about it, her? Well, listen, I think there's never been... She's, there's never been a woman... Yeah, president. no, exactly, yeah, right? So there's never been a woman who has won right. that great seat, right? And everybody Fair knows unfair, it, right? Yeah. Right? So that's the fear talking. All right. Jeff Mason, Jim Garrity, Heather McGee, the book, The Sum of Us, and a Young Reader's Edition. I do hope libraries are accepting this. I assume you haven't run into any problems? Okay, good. Anyway, thank you for all for being here. Up next, I'm going to speak to a member of the new Select Committee on China after the committee chair warns Washington it needs to toughen up in the face of a, quote, existential struggle with Beijing. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken met briefly with Russian Foreign Minister uh, Sergei Lavrov today on the sidelines of the G20 meeting in India. It was their first face-to-face -face meeting since Russia invaded Ukraine just over a year ago. Now, the State Department described the meeting, let's, let's probably meeting is a bit expansive. It was a brief encounter that lasted less than 10 minutes. 
so they ran into each other in the halls. Still, it was a face-to-face, -face, and Russia's foreign ministry said they spoke on the move at the end of a closed-door session and did not engage in any negotiations. During a press conference afterwards with reporters, though, Blinken said he underscored America's commitment to Ukraine, called for the release of jailed former Marine Paul Whelan, and urged Russia to return to the nuclear arms control treaty with the United States. I told the foreign minister that no matter what else is happening uh, in the world or in our relationship, the United States will always be ready to engage and act on strategic arms control, just as the United States and the Soviet Union did even at the height of the Cold War. While the war in Ukraine dominated the G20 ministerial meeting, it failed to produce a joint communique with Russia and China blocking it. It comes as the U.S. is reportedly in the early stages of drumming up support from allies, particularly the G7 nations, for potential sanctions on China if Beijing were to provide lethal aid, and we could prove it, uh, to Russia in its war with Ukraine. Joining me now is Congressman Jake Oshenklaas. He's a Democrat from Massachusetts, and he's a member of the China Select Committee. Congressman, really appreciate you coming in. Uh, you're also a veteran. I think that's important for folks to know as well. So thanks for coming in. So let me start with uh, simply the mission of this committee. Um, how would you describe the mission of this committee, and what does success look like? Good to be with you, Chuck. The mission of this committee is twofold. We want to rise above day-to-day -day politics to chart long-term sound strategy for competition with the Chinese Communist Party. And that requires, number one, creating shared awareness of the scope and severity of that challenge within Congress. And number two is putting forward discrete policy recommendations that can get buy-in from a supermajority of members of Congress, 70 percent of members of Congress going forward so that we have strong bipartisan consensus. It seems as if if you if you read in between the lines of the chairman's words and Mike Gallagher, I think what he hopes to get out of this right is a consensus that, hey, we've we have to decouple from China economically. What does decoupling look like? That's the challenge. And two, we got to be prepared to defend Taiwan. But let me ask you this. Do you think the American people understand why we would go to war with China over Taiwan if we if we did do that? Do you think they understand the, this yet or do you think they need uh, that more educating is necessary on this? I think the American people, like I will add the Taiwanese people from where I just returned from a Codel, would much prefer that we avoid war over Taiwan. And that means changing the cost-benefit analysis from uh, the viewpoint of Xi Jinping. We need to expedite foreign arms sales to Taiwan. We need to invest in their porcupine military strategy, which makes them indigestible. We need to help them achieve mm -hmm. energy independence so the Chinese couldn't blockade them and asphyxiate them. We need to help them counter Chinese Communist Party propaganda and influence campaigns. We have got to make Taiwan ready to fight for its independence and autonomy such that the CCP decides, no, not the right time. Do you think we need a uh, Pacific NATO? And I say this, you know, the TPP, which became... Uh, a, a three-letter acronym that became a four-letter word in American politics in 2016 was going to be an economic trade uh, 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 treaty that was supposed to serve as a check on China. Is there a way of putting that together as, as a sort of security pact, and should there be one? Uh, it's a terrific question. It's actually what I raised in my comments during our first hearing of the committee. I think we got to have a, a parallel approach here. So... On the one hand, we've got the Quad, Japan, United States, uh, India, and Australia, which is a security cooperation in the Indo-Pacific to try to ensure a free and open mm -hmm. uh, Indo-Pacific. We should build on the Quad. I call it the Quad Plus. Mm -hmm. Get new member countries to join those military exercises and joint planning, South Korea, for example. Uh, number two, we have got to resuscitate the TPP. Now, whether that starts with just a bilateral trade agreement with Taiwan, whether that's more expansive and looks to be the CPTPP uh, remains to be seen. But President Obama was right. Mm -hmm. Free trade agreement in the Indo-Pacific is the best way to contain Chinese aggression and expansionism on the Pacific Ocean. And we have got to lean back into trade and investment. Uh, let me get at something that a fellow Democratic member of Congress, Judy Chu, a Chinese American, um, she's, she voted against the, the creation of this committee, fearing that it was going to, um, that uh, accident, accidentally may be the wrong word, but uh, fearing that it would inevitably lead to more xenophobia. Um, given what she experienced with 
the criticism she got from Congressman Gooden. Uh, does she have a fair point here? We always need to be on guard that legitimate and indeed necessary focus on the strategic threat from the Chinese Communist Party does not devolve into one a casting of the Chinese people as our enemy. There are 1.4 billion Chinese people. There's 80 million members of the Chinese Communist Party. We wish no ill on the Chinese. Uh, and two, devolve into xenophobia or hate towards Chinese Americans or Americans of Asian descent. Uh, they are Americans and they deserve to feel safe and welcome in their communities. Uh, and it's unacceptable to be casting aspersions on the loyalties of a member of Congress. That's why it, it earned a bipartisan rebuke. And it's not in keeping with the spirit of this committee. I think as we have seen in the first two months of this committee, this committee is meant to be a bipartisan effort to rise above ad hominem politics and get serious about winning the 21st century. Uh, there was a comment that uh, I, I saw one person make that says, if you don't, if you're not worried about the threat from the Chinese Communist Party, you're not getting good intel briefings. Is that a fair, is that a fair way to put it? Yes. The more one learns about the CCP's activities overseas and indeed in their own country, the more alarming it is. They are thinking in 50-year timelines. They are incredibly sophisticated about how they try to mount disinformation campaigns and influence campaigns. Uh, they are patient. And they absolutely want to take the model that they have used on the Chinese mainland and make it a model that, that sets the rules for an international order. So that brings me to TikTok. Do you think that th this is reason enough to not just ban it from government devices, but do you think this TikTok's a threat to Americans generally and that we shouldn't have it available on our phones? There is one angle on TikTok that raises its political issues, and indeed it does have ties to the, to the CCP, and that's concerning. And I think the president needs to look seriously at what national security uh, challenges it poses and take actions accordingly. But then there's the second angle, which to me is more impactful, which is what TikTok, Instagram, Be Real, Facebook, what they do to kids' mental health. Yeah. We have seen a precipitous decline in children's socio-emotional well-being in the last 10 years. And it's because these companies, or it's in large part because these companies are monetizing our children's attention spans with no concern whatsoever for their well-being. And it's unfair for parents to have to try to stand up to a trillion dollar company with 10,000 right. engineers creating new algorithms, Congress needs to, needs to take charge. This sounds like the criticism I heard of tobacco companies in the 70s and 80s. It is deeply analogous, and the actions against the social media giants need to be equally muscular. What does that look like? I've proposed a age limit of 16 that's enforceable and verifiable to use these social media platforms. Parents mm -hmm. should be the gatekeepers and enough with this 13 year age limit that nobody tries to enforce and that's completely unverifiable. We gotta put teeth behind it because we have seen that adolescent boys and girls are yeah. suffering on these outlets. Would you put a would you put a time, you know, between sixteen and eighteen, you know, we had if you think about the old days of near beer, I mean would you say, okay, you only get two hours if you're under the age of eighteen a night uh, on social media? I think the key is that the defaults should put parents in the driver's seat. Right now, you've got parents who have to figure out how to use these apps and how to, how to control their, their kids and monitor their kids' usage of it, and they're at a disadvantage, and that's just not fair. Parents need to be in the driver's seat after, after uh, kids are on those programs. No, nope. and it is uh, on the tech companies to uh, make that uh, possible for us. Congressman Austin Claus, Jake Austin Claus, Democrat, Massachusetts. Appreciate you coming on, member of that new select committee on China. Up next, Iranian authorities say they are investigating the poisoning of hundreds of schoolgirls across the country in what appears to be in a deliberate attack. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. Weeks of ongoing protests in Israel turned violent for the first time yesterday as police in Tel Aviv used water cannons and stun grenades in an attempt to disperse thousands of demonstrators who took to the streets to once again protest Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who's planned to overhaul the country's judiciary and weaken Israel's Supreme Court. The move has sparked the largest protest movement in Israel in more than a decade. 
Netanyahu's plan would give lawmakers and parliament control over the appointment of judges as well as the authority to overrule the Supreme Court. The legislation would also give parliament the ability to pass laws that aren't subject to judicial review. Netanyahu, by the way, just coincidentally happens to be on trial for corruption charges right now, says the changes are needed to rein in the power of unelected judges. Critics, of course, say the plan would be a direct threat to Israel's democratic system of checks and balances and that Netanyahu's focus is just about his own issues. But despite the unrest, one of the architects of the overhaul says the mounting protests will not stop the legislation. Let me turn now to Iran, where authorities are investigating what the Iranian government is calling potentially deliberate poisoning of hundreds of schoolgirls. According to senior officials, the girls from schools across the country have been suffering respiratory, cardiac, and neurological symptoms. Iranian media is reporting that the poisonings have been taking place for months. Officials also say it may have been a coordinated effort to prevent girls from receiving an education. All of this comes amid the other protest movements that have been all over the country that have erupted against the Iranian regime in recent months. Protests, perhaps not coincidentally, led by women and girls. With me now is Holly Dagris, a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council whose focus is on Iran. Holly, I appreciate you coming in. Um, I think what surprised us on this story is the fact that the government officially is acknowledging this problem. Here's what it tells me. It means that they don't know what to do, or that's why they're going public. Do they need help? Why do you think they went public with this? Well, um, Chuck, this has actually been going on since November 30th, where we saw the first incident happen in the holy city of Rome. It's mm -hmm. been a story for some time in Iran, and it was only when it started hitting other cities, like the capital Tehran, that we actually saw that it was getting attention because Iranians were making noise about it. Mm -hmm. Parents, understandably worried and concerned about the health of their daughters, were starting to protest after outside of schools. And there was so much pressure on authorities to actually take action. Did this actually become a topic of a conversation in the country? I guess that's what's... Is so... Is there, can we trust the Iranian government to do a thorough investigation? You're already shaking your head. No, and the reason I'm shaking my head is that this is a, a repressive government. Mm -hmm. um, they have eyes and ears everywhere. How is it that they have surveillance technology from China to actually monitor if a woman is wearing mandatory hijab in a metro station, but they're not able to actually understand where or how this is happening in uh, reportedly at least 15 cities across the country? So it's leading a lot of Iranians to believe in that this is deliberate and we've actually heard the deputy health minister say that this is deliberate and it, ironically just right after he said that he said he was misquoted oh, and I was just gonna say <laughs> is he still the deputy health minister or he had to come out with the oh I was misquoted he was misquoted okay. alleged yeah. he alleges but the truth be told is that a lot of Iranians rightfully believe that this was an act of revenge we have to remember that the mass protests that have been continuous since mid-September 2022 after mm -hmm. the murder of mass Gina Amini were led by young Iranian girls, Iranian Gen Z, and these are the targets right now. So this seems to be an act of revenge against these very girls. You know, this is this is what authoritarian regimes that get accused of genocide do. Um, what should the world community be doing right now about this? Well, they definitely should not be ignoring it. We should be hearing more um, condemnation of what's happening. We've heard the State Department say that Iran must investigate what's happening. But as we can see, they've been very incompetent at that, purposely so. Possibly mm -hmm. there's been already pressure on families. There's been arrests. Um, just the other day, a very brutal video of a woman um, just protesting outside of school, worried about her daughter's well-being, having her hair and her clothes taken and just pulled away and stepped into, pushed into a unmarked vehicle. We don't even know where this woman went. So, it's telling us that they're not they're not listening. How are our eyes and ears? Right, we've always said our on the ground. We're we're good at surveilling Iran. We're not good at sort of as our intelligence sort of being inside that in many ways Israel's got better eyes and ears in Iran than the US does any of the intelligence assessments here have an idea of where this is emanating from it's really um, hard to say unfortunately because Iran is ruled by an authoritarian government mm -hmm. um, the Iranians the only way they're able to get their voices out to the world is through social media so the only way we've been really seeing what's happening these videos that have been coming out on social media of girls being hospitalized not able to breathe talking about their symptoms and of course the parents being pushed into unmarked vehicles is is really what we're able to rely upon right now 
Um, you are a, an expert on Iran for the Atlantic Council, which means the other piece of news this week had to do with how close they are, in theory, to enriching uranium to weapons grade. Um, there seems to be not the amount of alarm that you might expect from the West on this. Why is that? Well, there's a, lo there's a lot going on in the world, for starters, and I think mm. that um, when we look at the 84% um, that has been right. reported in the International Atomic Energy Agency's latest report, Right now, there's still there's a sense that these were just particles traced, not that Iran was necessarily actually keeping this. Mm -hmm. um, nevertheless, that means it's near weapons grade. Ninety percent is near weapons right. grade, and so there there is definitely concern. But I, I get the sense that maybe they're thinking about our other options, uh, Plan yeah. B. Holly Dagris uh, from the Atlantic Council, uh, the Iranian expert over there. Appreciate you coming in and and helping uh, shed some light on what is just a very very scary story in Iran with the uh, with young women. Thanks very much. Thank you all for being with us this hour. I'll be back tomorrow with more Meet the Press Now. NBC News Now coverage continues with Hallie Jackson right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.